of women across the full value chain of energy generation, transmission and distribution, ensuring that women have access to market, access to technology, access to finance and access to networks. So I encourage you today to have your notebook and take as many notes as possible as our experts share their insights. Our program today is slightly different from the webinars we have held in the year in that we are focusing truly on discussing um, these complex, comp complex concepts on the energy crisis in South Africa. We want to uh, ensure that we deliver the description of the concepts in a palatable manner, that if you're confused about what is being proposed as a solution for the country, today is the day that you would get explanation or descriptions of what is taking place. And therefore we've got three key presentations that will focus on the evolution of the electricity grid and the impact of renewable energy uptake we're then going to look at the renewable energy, um, renewable energy independent power producer procure, procurement program, the challenges it has faced and the opportunities uh, presented by those challenges. As they say, we should never let a crisis go to waste. Every crisis presents an opportunity. We are then going to look at emerging policies um, that or the evolution of policies that are aligned to the proposals that have been made to resolve the country's energy crisis. And so without further delays, I will call upon our first speaker, who is Mestempele Rampok Anyo, Managing Director of Rampok's Energy, who is going to share with us the challenges, opportunities, and possible solutions as we look at the evolution of the electricity grid. Mr. Rampak Anyo, the floor is yours. You may begin with your presentation. I would, while we have his presentation um, uh, broadcast, I encourage you to use the Q&A platform to deposit your questions. Our speakers will be ready to answer your questions. You can use the chat platform to give comments and to connect with other delegates that are attending. Enjoy the rest of the session. Thanks a lot, uh, Jose Pepper. Yes, uh, the name is Mpiri Rampokanyo, and uh, I'll be taking you through the evolution of the uh, electricity grid and impact of renewable energy uptake with a, spe a special focus, obviously, on the, on the South African grid specifically. And so just to take you through my presentation outline, I'll go through the, uh, the background on energy transition and I will touch on the IRP outlook, uh, some energy balances uh, of the South African uh, um, energy. Uh, I'll also touch on the challenges on the, the grid uh, due to uh, renewable energy integration, uh, the current utility structure in South Africa uh, that is constituting generation, transmission, and distribution, the grid evolution, uh, central versus the decentralized control, and then opportunities for local entrepreneurs to solve uh, the aforementioned challenges uh, in the spaces of microgrids and uh, small scale embedded generation and, and hydrogen fuel economy as well. So, in terms of the, the background to energy transition, um, uh, as we know that, uh, that, that there is this huge global trial to uh, reduce carbon footprint in the environment. The world is looking at alternative sources of energy that are less pollutant and cheaper to finance. And uh, widespread introduction of rest uh, sources is, as an alternative energy source for the future. Um, obviously, the electricity sector is one of the big off takers of this primary energy source. And this uh, introduction of uh, renewable energy uh, sources onto the grid uh, brings uh, a lot of benefits, as we know and are currently seeing, but uh, it is uh, certainly not without challenges. Um, so there are two drivers uh, to this energy uh, transition at uh, uh, which are finite resources, um, as you know, our 
yeah, fossil fuel and supply and it's uh, coal, gas, oil in South Africa, obviously, and um, the larger uh, being a uh, coal and um, our European counterparts, I think uh, um, a lot of them rely on oil. Um, so this obviously leads to carbon emissions. Uh, so we need to reduce uh, the carbon emissions in the environment, you know, and this leads to uh, obviously price pressure and uh, regulatory policy pressure uh, from governments. Next slide. And then uh, obviously there's uh, two results in mega trends, uh, uh, which is energy efficiency, uh, getting more output from the same amount of energy input or using less energy input uh, for the same amount of output. And then the other obviously being a renewable energy uptake, energy sources that are supplied uh, indefinitely in human uh, time scales, that is uh, you know, our natural resources. Uh, next slide. Yeah, just to take you through the 2019 South African Independent Resource Plan Outlook. Um, so this is the current RFP that we are running to. It's running until 2030. And um, it had been a bit different uh, this year or uh, when it was promulgated in, uh, back in 2019. It normally spends a, a bigger period, but because of some challenges uh, with regard to system stability, it was a... Uh, um, yeah, I asserted that uh, it's better that uh, it's, uh, it goes up to 2030 and beyond uh, 2030, then you start looking at stability problems. So that's uh, obviously uh, a classified information for people that are in the, in the in this uh, type of things, but uh, that's um, what's happening there. Uh, and then if we go further in terms of the, the energy balances of the um, South Africa, you see that we are highly reliant on, on coal production, you know, our Electricity uh, 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 sector is uh, fed from that, and it, uh, obviously, uh, it drives uh, uh, different uh, economic sectors. You know, and so yeah, there is a small uptake of renewable energy, but it's not uh, anything to write home about. Uh, we only at around uh, uh, six gigawatts at the moment. Next slide. So. We if we look at the, the challenges on the, the, the South African power grid, uh, the first one that uh, I would like to mention is uh, the, the, the fact that we are vertically integrated utility. You know, we have one uh, uh, utility that basically uh, is vertically uh, integrated, constitutes generation, uh, transmission grid, and uh, uh, distribution grid with um, um, uh, our municipality. Um, um, authorities uh, being uh, the, the, the final um, um, uh, suppliers for end users. So this is uh, obviously creates a mono monopoly to electricity provision, and obviously we need to, to start dispensing this. Uh, next slide. Then um, if we zoom into the generation level and we look at the challenges there, uh, as we have already seen, there's heavy reliance on coal, um, in terms of generation of electricity. And then uh, we are currently experiencing a lot of uh, 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 plant failures that uh, are as a result of uh, things called boiler tube leaks in the power station. So we are having uh, this uh, um, the problems of load shedding due to, to, to uh, largely this, uh, this uh, boiler failures. And obviously there is another uh, problem of a deficit supply where you find that our demand is, uh, is, is greater than our supply our current capacity, you know, and so that is another challenge. Uh, next slide. And then if we zoom into the, the transmission grid, uh, obviously including the, the, the distribution grid or what we call the wires uh, um, the business, we have challenges as a result of uh, uptake of renewables uh, due to things called stability of the power system and the variability of this uh, uh, renewable energy grid constraints, uh, central control uh, uh, problems, uh, you know, the fact that we are centrally uh, controlling and then we don't have, uh, we as end user customers that don't have uh, um, an effect in, in terms of how the system is run is another constraint. Uh, you know, supply uh, demand balance. Uh, that's uh, the, the the main challenges that we are we are facing. You to mention uh, just to zoom in a bit into into stability. I'm sure a lot of us have heard a lot about uh, renewable energy 
uh, post instability problems. It's as a result of mainly something called uh, erosion of the uh, uh, power system in Asia, which is basically just the inherent rotational energy of uh, our generation plants, or you know, our conventional generation plants, and uh, on the on the power system have this uh, uh, um, resistance to change in in in, in motion uh, type of characteristic where when you have the uh, incidence of the grid, they are able to to impede. Uh, to impede those disturbances, you know, so that is the uh, the stability there. So when you introduce inverter based generation, which is largely renewable and renewable generation, largely is inverter based. So when you start introducing that, then you start having this uh, a problem of stability as you 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 will be displacing the the conventional generation to inverter based generation, and say. Uh, and um, leaving the system a bit uh, vulnerable to that. So, but that's those are the some some of the things that we are uh, we are solving as engineers. You know, it's not a, a, a train smash. Yeah, we, we are all very much aware of the problem. And, and then at municipal level, um, our big challenges is uh, infrastructure failures um, uh, because of lack of maintenance. You find that we have a lot of these infrastructure failures and lack of monitoring in terms of who connects and doesn't connect the substations. We find that we have a lot of failures because of that. Uh, so that's leading to visualization. Our uh, municipalities are not uh, fully uh, 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 capacitated to, to actually see each and every node in their network in terms of what's happening there. Uh, so that's another constraint and challenge. Uh, in adequate infrastructure, we don't have much. You know, we are, the population is increasing. Uh, there's a lot of households to electrify. You find that the infrastructure is not and uh, enough and capable to supply the rest of the, of, the, of the country. Skills deficit is a big concern in the municipality. Now that you are taking up renewable energy, it's a, even a bigger concern uh, because now the, that means the engineers will need to deal with the, the fact that there's embedded generation that uh, uh, they need to understand the impacts you know, onto, their, onto their systems. Yeah, that's another. And they, obviously there's no skills in that aspect. So, so yeah, so there's, 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 it's a big challenge. Restructuring of tariffs. Uh, as we um, put this renewable energy, uh, then we have to restructure uh, the tariffs at municipal level. You know, uh, so um, that is another 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 uh, uh, challenge that we face. And then, if you look at the grid evolution, um, you know, the current system, as you can see reflected there, uh, it's um, largely centrally controlled. You have this uh, large transmission uh, backbone that's uh, feeding a different uh, a load centers, you know, uh, with uh, the generation uh, coming off from a certain region of the country in South Africa, for instance, uh, our, um, uh, the most, most of our fleet is in uh, uh, the Mpumalanga region, where, uh, you know, out the back of our um, coal-fired station situation. So it goes via this uh, large transmission corridors uh, to, to different uh, um, uh, distributors uh, in order to supply the end, end, the end uh, customers. So that's uh, the current uh, uh, network. But if we look at uh, the future network, and we are going into a future where we are, will be connecting up the uh, things that are called micro here, uh, they're called islands, and uh, simply because they're I mean, micro and um, uh, have an um, islanding capabilities. Basically, islanding means that uh, it's able to to stand on its own, that particular uh, creed and island from the rest of the of the creed and and can be autonomous. You know, uh, you would have a local generation there. You have local demand, and you can actually, if there are problems, uh, you you can create this island. So this is very 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 uh, good for the power system. So that's where we are going. The uh, uptake of small scale embedded generation on our municipal networks in our different forms, uh, rooftop PVs, it's leading into this. Uh, a trajectory of a micro creed. It's uh, starting right uh, uh, from your from your home, you know. So that's where we are going. And it doesn't actually matter what the, the government will do in terms of restructuring the monopoly that they need to do, obviously, to encourage competition. But um, um, at a, at a, at a very very customer level, this is this is happening. You know, the structure of the creed is happening as we we take this a uh, small scale embedded generation. So. It's something that is a, it's a, a important to watch out for. So if we look at practical solutions and opportunities for local entrepreneurs in this space, 
as I've touched on that we are going into the realm of a microcrete and uh, small scale embedded generation give rise to these microcrete. And uh, as I've said that your home, your single home itself can be a microcrete uh, and it is a microcrete if you start uh, putting in things like a uh, small scale embedded generation that is rooftop PVs uh, on your home. And then you can start operating it like a microcrete. So it, it's, it's modular, it's scalable. It can be a home, it can be an, 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 an industrial complex, and a commercial or office complex, and a mine, a plant. Uh, so it's scalable like that. It starts from very small, even at your home. The, the nice thing about this microcrete concept is that you are able to classify your, your, your load. Uh, so basically, we can classify in terms of uh, which uh, load is important and uh, are able to uh, supply this particular load that's more important, essential, uh, maybe through uh, 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 your rooftop, rooftop PV and while, while the rest of the load maybe relies uh, still on, on ESCOM. You know? So that, that, that's a big opportunity that as, uh, entrepreneurs needs to be creative about and start uh, implementing concepts of microcrete around homes and uh, our residential areas. You know, it's something that is uh, um, there already just that needs to be to be uh, uh, exploited further in, uh, in terms of uh, creative uh, uh, ways of uh, making it uh, happen you know you don't have to electrify your home because currently the, the the problem is affordability of this uh, uh, rooftop pvs in our homes where you find that uh, um you know the the capital outlay that is required to uh, to put uh, through a, a pv system for a five kilowatts of uh, a, a demand load at home is quite is quite is quite heavy so then uh, uh, if you uh, use the concept of microcrete you can easily uh, classify the load at home so if I'm, I'm going to um, uh, for instance power the fridge the tv alone with renewable energy. maybe you might end up having just the two panels two uh, rooftop panels uh, and uh, that are powering uh, specifically are dedicated for those uh, uh, loads you know so entrepreneurs need to be clever about this thing and not just for a template that, uh, that everybody's using there. You find that everybody wants to, to, to electrify the whole home and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very, 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 it sounds very expensive. So you just need to understand the concept of microchip and you can easily uh, do this at very, very, very affordable rates. So, yeah. And then you can scale up as time goes. Okay, next, uh, next slide. Then if you look at the components of the microcrete uh, that of interest, um, it's things like a microcrete controller. So I had the, uh, the, the pleasure of implementing one at a, a blind battery in the, in, the, in the Eastern Cape where this uh, particular microcrete controller was controlling and, and then a different generation sources. Uh, that is battery storage, diesel, uh, as gen set, uh, PV generation, as well as uh, the crete, and there was as well, what I didn't uh, put here, I think is the, the miniature wind turbines that we put uh, lately as well. And so this micro crete actually had a strategy, uh, a dispatch strategy to actually control these things. So at, the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at, at larger scales, when you have different energy sources, you need this controller because the inherent, the controller that you have with an inverter, uh, especially for, for instance, for hybrid inverters that have batteries, and that particular one, you will find that it will be limited when you start integrating things like uh, uh, diesel gen sets, and you start integrating things like uh, maybe miniature wind turbines, you know, it will be, it will not be able to do that. So that's when now uh, it opens up room for the creation of this micro -creed. So this was for a, a remote uh, rural village in the, in the Eastern Cape that we implemented the solution for. So, so yeah, so it's, um, one of the, the 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 interesting things and opportunities that entrepreneurs can do and can leverage this and uh, and and actually localize it in South Africa because there's no reason why microchip controllers cannot be and uh, uh, produced in South Africa. You know, if we uh, take advantage of that, yeah. So another one and uh, a component of this microchip is the uh, the thing that is called. Uh, uh, Hydrogen fuel cells, you know, the hydrogen fuel uh, economy is uh, increasing a lot. Uh, I see that the slide is changed a bit. Uh, uh, the dotted lines are supposed to be covering the hydrogen uh, portion there. So I think it is, uh, 
is a bit of a mistake then. Yeah, I was trying to zoom into that. But um, yeah, the hydrogen uh, cylinders, as you can see on the bottom there, are meant to give you an idea of um, hydrogen production on site in a, a particular microchip that was uh, implemented at Kofim Baba. Uh, in the in the in the Eastern Cape as well uh, that we, we have the pleasure of implementing at the Science Center there, and whilst I was uh, um, uh, uh, leading some research work at the CSIR, and uh, this particular work was funded by the uh, Department of Science and Technology. And yeah, so so then um, it, it, it's one aspect uh, that uh, can actually be taken advantage of a uh, green hydrogen generation where you have an electrolyzer. And that basically uses water to separate hydrogen, uh, and you can generate hydrogen from that water and feed it uh, back into a hydrogen fuel cell that will take that uh, hydrogen and, and and produce electricity. You know, um, yeah. So 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 it's uh, one example of uh, of uh, of generating a clean hydrogen a solution within the the confines of a microgrid. So uh, yeah, opportunities are immense. So next next one. And ultimately, in terms of the vision uh, that we are looking uh, uh, to as countries, we are looking at uh, complete green solutions where our primary energy source comes from our natural resources. And uh, so this gives that picture where you find that the electricity the provision uh, or generation comes directly from uh, our uh, natural resources. And this uh, is used to obviously power our economy, the transport sector, uh, via a clean hydrogen uh, economy, when uh, you find that uh, the hydrogen generated from the electrolysis there um, it goes uh, directly and fits um, uh, our transport sector as a clean fuel. And uh, so that's that's where we are. We are leading uh, as uh, as nations of the world uh, to, to get to to the space where we'll be uh, a bit um, uh, lenient and soft on the environment in terms of the uh, in terms of the um, emissions. Um, so next slide. Thanks. Then in summary, uh, in terms of the opportunities that I've already highlighted, a uh, small scale embedded generation, obviously this is the big trial of microgrid development. It's already taking shape. We just need to start exploiting and understanding the concepts of microgrid so that we can start taking advantage of this. And the microgrid development, obviously they are modular. Uh, scalable solutions uh, that can be a fit for residential, commercial, industrial sectors. You know, you can have things like urban smart cities that are based on microgrids, uh, smart campuses, uh, you know, at schools, at offices, uh, and so on and so forth. Remote and rural areas that are electrified is a big opportunity in the sub Saharan Africa, where you find that, uh, you know, there's big uptake of these microgrids to, you know, electrify the uh, remote rural areas. Uh, 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 villages, so so this is a good thing, and then obviously the uh, manufacturing of a microcontroller that can be localized, you know, uh, in our uh, you know African countries, and um, yeah, uh, instead of uh, you know us just uh, receiving them from our European counterparts, you can easily do this kind of things as uh, engineers here. Obviously, the other thing is uh, the uh, green hydrogen economy that needs to be uh, uh, taken and exploited. Um, yeah, I think uh, this then uh, brings me to uh, the conclusion of my presentation. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much for that detailed uh, presentation on the evolution of the electricity grid. I'm quite um, enlightened and impressed with how you have tackled each part of the how each part of the grid and how it has actually transformed and concluding with uh, entrepreneurial opportunities that are available. There are two very important questions that are waiting for you to address on the Q&A and um, we will continue with the discussion. Next uh, speaker is a well-known, is not um, unfamiliar to the energy sector. He has written a number of uh, publications and also presented at a number of local and international platforms. This is Dr. Stanley Similane, who is going to speak on emerging policies in the energy and power sector. We are 
wanting to ensure that this crisis that we are facing, not only in South Africa, but on the continent as we pursue universal access to electricity, it does not go to waste. Every crisis presents an opportunity. And Dr. Samelan is going to talk to us from a policy perspective on the uh, emerging policies, especially as we consider and con contemplate the proposals that have been put forth to resolve South Africa's energy crisis. Dr. Smelani, over to you. Thank you, Beth. So, uh, yeah, you can just uh, go straight to, to the content that I'll be covering. Let me start by greeting everyone that is here, the audience. Say good afternoon. I don't know which country you're listening from, but uh, thank you for, for joining us. I am going to be speaking briefly on some of the ideas uh, that I, I think about, and they evolve over time. <laughs> so when I was sleeping last night, I wanted to change some things in this presentation. As I you know, look at the South African energy transition and some of the policies that would be required. So you can just go to my first slide. So I'm not going to dwell much. There are some barely covered some of the drivers, but mainly maybe I want to frame my discussion in this manner. So from a South African perspective, we have an aging coal fleet, which needs to be replaced. Uh, then your integrated resource plan tells you which technologies the government is going to procure over time. In fact, that policy has to be reviewed every two years, but we know that has not really happened if you compare when it was first gazetted in 2011. That's one. Two, uh, there's this climate change global problem. So that's not a South African problem. That's a global problem. So we'll see and attach uh, later on, on, on my conclusion, on some of the climate change models in terms of what they're telling us. So I, I do touch that briefly. Then back to South Africa again, uh, maybe even global. Uh, last year, the COP26, most countries, close to 200 countries, had some national uh, determined contribution. So they made commitments, particularly in South Africa, with an ambitious commitment in terms of what you want to do around climate change. So this is what is driving where we're heading. Next slide, please. So this is just a landscape of, of where we started. from. So from the left going down, you'd see 1998 already the, the white paper on, on energy. Uh, we started to speak about renewables in 2003. And around that time, we I think in 2002, we had the second cheapest electricity in the world as a country during that time. So. Yeah, and subsequent to that, 2008, we already had our first load shedding energy challenges. So this is just a landscape, and I want to focus on my far right, where after the Kyoto Protocol, we had the Paris Agreement that was endorsed in, 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 in 2015, and subsequent to that, we just kept on trying to procure more renewables, and this is not happening in South Africa only, but this there's a transition that is going on globally. So there's been an adoption and of, of renewables globally, uh, 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 and that is continuing to gain momentum. So, from, so, so I want to speak on this slide about how then South Africa responds to this energy crisis and all these climate change uh, challenges that we have. Firstly, we, we've been struggling to meet our demand. As a result, just to protect the entire power system, that's how we end up having load shedding. Secondly, uh, energy, our energy availability factor has been declining over the years. So that's, that's, that's the big challenge, although the capacity is there, but the challenge is in that area. Uh, there's a lot of maintenance backlog that we've had around that, that results in load shedding. So what government has done from last year, remember just uh, last year, uh, the president of South Africa announced that uh, there, will, there, will, there will be no need for license requirements for up to 100 megawatts. And recently, now we have no limit 
except of course registering with NERSA, uh, you know, and I think the uh, error will have to be amended to accommodate the unlimited, because if you see the amendments that were done last year after the announcement was only you know, allowing anyone that wants to produce electricity that is less than 100 megawatt to, 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 to be able to do that without a license, but recently we've learned that. So, yeah, that, and that is done through section 34 of, 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 of the Electricity Regulation Act. That's the error. So, the, so in South Africa, we have this uh, energy crisis, right? And then government tries to respond to this by amending this uh, Electricity Regulation Act, whereby municipalities are now allowed to, you know, play a a role, uh, if you like, uh, on 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 pro pro providing their own electricity. So basically, we're moving from this monopoly system into a vertical integrated type 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 system, where you know you start gonna you're gonna have a lot of generators. So that, that's 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 that. So if you look on the last point there, uh, where I speak about resolving some of the uh, uh, challenges through, you know, removing a, 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 or granting exemption on licensing. That is where we are. So we, so the driver basically, and I'm not sure if that is the correct approach. I'm not saying it's incorrect, but we have to think about to say, how do we really respond to the energy crisis? And when we think about this energy crisis, I know everyone we want to see the load shedding problem resolved, but because the, the, the energy transition is something that is happening globally and it, it's not something that's going to stop. We have to think about how are we going to optimize the benefits that comes with the transition. You can go to the next slide. So, 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 I think some of the policies that would be needed in relation to the, this context that I've just given in the previous slide, in terms of how the government responds, you have this climate change risk, right? And you have two school of thoughts. Those that have are sitting in Pumalang, areas like Whitbank, where there's a lot of coal power stations. They call for one, what they call environmental justice. So they're saying the, the air quality uh, 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 of the areas that they're staying in, it's not good. But at the same time, we've seen in places like Hendrina, where the impact of shutting down some coal power station uh, has been felt. And now there's this, you know, uh, socioeconomic challenges. So people that were working in mining there, uh, when I attended some of the workshops there, I realized that, uh, you know, there were some challenges from, from social economic challenges and other, so that's one. Secondly, uh, from the NTC commitments, I think, I don't, I, the reason here I, I say, I, I'm saying with the key focus on adaptation and economic diversification option is because as you are phasing down the, these uh, carbon intensive industries, there's going to be challenges in terms of the socioeconomic benefits that are coming with these industries. So if you don't plan properly in terms of what you're going to do with those areas, what are you going to do with the water that might be available in that area? Which other you know, sectors can you start to establish in those areas so that you keep those economies going? That's one. Secondly, uh, adaptation is key. You've seen what happened in Devon recently, uh, all those floods. So our infrastructure has to be resilient to, to climate change. Because whether I like it or not, if you check the temperatures, whether we, so I'm not talking about whether we're the cause or not the cause of climate change. The fact is we are the most vulnerable. So if there are floods because of our poverty levels as a country, as a region, 
we are the ones that are going to be affected the most. So, 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 so it's important to think about how is our infrastructure going to adapt. So if you check the NDC report, uh, the one that we tabled at the COP26 last year and zoom into the adaptation section there, you'd see that there's a need to ensure, to make sure that our infrastructure is resilient and that is cost. So for example, uh, nobody planned to spend money in the KZN floods, but we had to spend because those are the challenges. Then I'm gonna to try to move faster. Then local manufacturing opportunities, a new industry creation, Cheap electricity must not be an opportunity cost, uh, 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 or there's some, there's some opportunity cost, let me put it that way. So what I'm trying to say here is that, you know, the driver, if you think about it, it would be it, speed window one, sitting at around three, over three and per kilowatt hour of solar. So the reason we adopted renewables was not because of price. That's, what, that's the point I'm bringing home. The driver was climate change to say we, we will adopt it even if it's expensive. Subsequent 10 years later, it is, the prices decline drastically. So uh, then it becomes the cheap electricity. But there is a problem on the second point where I speak about managing the competition among the IPPs because IPPs win bids based on price. So we saw the last price was around 45 cents per kilowatt hour. The, on the bit window five, that way, how the, the ones that are still uh, trying to reach financial close. But that can drive what I call an unjust transition. Because everyone will want to have the cheapest electricity, right? That's why if you look the map on the right, there's no grid available or, anymore on the uh, Northern Cape, for example because that's where, that's where you're producing your cheapest electricity. And the next area that will produce your cheapest electricity from a solar radiation point of view, that, that those are the next areas that are likely to, 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 to not to have great access moving forward because of this competition. And I see this as a driver for what I call unjust transition. For example, some of the things we could think about is even if these guys are saying we can deliver this project, at 45 cents. If government were to say, for example, I'm gonna buy it at, or let's agree that the off taker, which is as common in this regard, buys it at 85 cents, but we ring fence 20 cent for a fund, just transition fund, that will ensure that there's some economic activities, there's some basket of money that could be there for the areas that would be inverted commas phasing down all the other economies and adopting the others. That's, that's, those are some of the things. And then maybe take the other 20 cents and say, okay, I'm going to have a local content fund or whatever the name, the name doesn't matter, but that's the concept. To say you could, through this program, as you're adopting these technologies and then start to come with innovative ways of trying to raise capital. And the application process could be the same as you apply you know, for a bankable project. And then we can start to think about other sectors that we diversify into. So that's, that's, that's one. So all I'm saying is a load shading pressure should not you know, exacerbate unjust transition. So as we amend, and I'm not even sure, I keep on asking myself, so the amendment and that has to happen in relation to the announcement that was made a few weeks ago uh, around the unlimited uh, exemption for, for licensing purposes. Is that forever or, cause we know the challenge now is about the 5,000 megawatts or so that uh, ESCOM needs to manage the load shedding problem. So it looks like if we move forward, the new way of doing things, anyone that wants to generate electricity will not require a license as long as you have the capital at home and so on. As long as you register, you'll be able to generate your power. And maybe th those are some of the you know, opportunities that uh, entrepreneurs can, can start to think about to say, what does it mean? Who's going to maintain this infrastructure? If I have a rooftop that I buy from, 
a specific component household, I install that. If I have challenges with it, because I, I, I'm assuming that it would be owned by the house owners, who's going to maintain that? So those are the new services that would come in line. Because, you know, if you think about opportunities at the reprogram, and I know I'm not, I'm not I'm speaking on police, but you see there, there's a lot of capital investment that is required just to even prepare a project. So enter, entrepreneurs, some of them don't have the capital to even, you know, uh, play in that space. So we ought to think about from police, how do we avail funds so that the program is more inclusive? I know the program has ECD, SED initiative, ED initiatives, but that was generally ring fenced to the 50 kilometer radius of where the projects are. Maybe just on the last, uh, last bullet point where I say energy planning and, and infrastructure implementation. For example, when are we going to uh, you know, build more transmission line, more grid so that we continue? Or are we moving to these other areas where they, there's grid availability? I see a Western Cape is still looking okay, but it will be gone soon, even Eastern Cape. So we ought to think about how do we plan, when do we build these things, where is the money going to come from, et cetera. So that, I think those are some of the policies that we need to think about. So I spoke about inclusivity, I spoke about the infrastructure, I spoke about some ideas around how do we raise the money or create some capital to ensure that as we adopt these technologies, at least you open the market for everybody to start to participate. And I'll tell you some ideas that I, I have about, uh, uh, around this. Next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, if you, th you, you look at the slide, I, I intentionally did this slide so that what I was trying to demonstrate here is the size. So we call these developing countries, but you, you can see when you compare South Africa, our total installed capacity is about 53 gigawatt. And you, you, you look at Brazil, you look at India, that sits with about 403 gigawatts. And you look at renewables, even you compare, we're sitting at about 5.2 gigawatts. And you look at China, so the point I'm trying to bring home here, please move to the next slide, is that, uh, you know, if you want to localize from the economy scale point of view, you are going to have challenges. Maybe the new announcement that says, okay, do you know the license is going to grow, open up the market more? But I don't think even the size of our power system, our power system does not justify. So, and we, we learned some lessons from all the companies that were playing, whether in assembling plants and so on, some funded by institutions like ITC, et cetera. They went down and for some other reasons, but some, even when they were here, IPPs were not ordering from them because it was, it's more expensive than importing these components. So the government must decide, or as a country, we must decide, what do you want? Do you want cheap electricity and hope that that cheap electricity produced by imported components will drive economic development? Or we want to create industries locally? So it has to be a gradual approach. And, and I, I, I will, Broaden this thinking in, in if, if you can go to my next slide so that I can con continue with this thinking. Maybe just go, if, if you can pause on that slide, apologies for that. If you could just the back slide because I did not speak to the African map. Uh, so, so I'm saying the reason I have this, this map on the right. So if you were to think about this through a continental approach, maybe you could start to justify, especially if you wanna think about the 
renewable energy resources that are available in the African continent. So if you look like Cote d'Ivoire, you know, West Africa, we have a great resource, Namibia moving. Generally, the African continent on average sits between uh, 5.2 to 5.6 kilowatt hours per square meter. So it's sufficient, even on wind, we, we, we have a lot of uh, projects that could be bankable. If you were to think it in that manner, maybe you can justify to say, why, why do you want to manufacture? However, South Africa cannot, that's my view, cannot manufacture everything, particularly on the renewable energy components. I'm, I'm, I'm saying, I'm proposing that we'll have to decide what is it that you want to focus on. Because other countries, you know, trade, is, is, is it's, it's, it's about you supply certain components and you get other components from, from your partners. So we cannot say we want to do everything. So we ought to think to say how you want to play in the market. But I think the point here I'm trying to say, there's a great opportunity in the African market. Then we can go to the next slide. So on the next slide, what I'm trying to say here, so, you see, these are just, it, this is the value chain for, for, for wind uh, turbines. My view is that the bus is gone. That's my view in relation to the context I gave you around the size of our power system. So, but we have capabilities around generators, and I know there are OEMs playing in the space as well, but we have sectors that are already existing playing in the steel parts. So if you think about the acetylometal, you think about our automobile sector, if in their production lines they were to supply certain things that would be required, then maybe you could benefit. But to start a plant from scratch, even those that call themselves manufacturers in the American context sometimes mean that they have an assembly plant. So my view is that the past might be gone and I might be incorrect, but you know, uh, how many wind turbines or megawatts you're going to procure between now and the next 10 years, you must think about that and think about the market and the demand. Next slide, please. So yeah, and the same analogy for, 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 for solar, there are opportunities, but I think they sit mainly on the assembly plants. So you see my arrows where they start. I think we are not going to be, you know, mining uh, silicon and starting the process from scratch. Maybe, I don't know how a practical could be this. Some of the players in the glass sector could play and provide certain components. So that's how I see some of the opportunities. While, you know, there's IP issues that were mentioned earlier, uh, 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 but I think there's a room to play within from this arrow. And then uh, next slide, I think that's where the opportunities are, are still available, but first movers are going to win. So if you think of the raw materials that we have, also thinking from a regional or a continental perspective, cobalt, nickel, we do have resources really to produce batteries. And we know that while uh, those that speak of carbon emissions uh, focus, or maybe the discussion today, the focus is on electricity, but the transport sector also emits a lot of 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 uh, uh, carbon so there's an opportunity if there's going to be a takeoff uh, for electric vehicles battery all these things that you are doing because of load shading as a driver or just uh, you know having all these independent generators battery is going to be an enabler to where we are heading so that's where the opportunity is i think that we can grab as a country and think about it thoroughly in terms of how can we you know, put our efforts on the battery technology. And other countries are doing research in this space, but I think first movers are going to be to win as the battery prices really come down. So I, that's why I think the opportunity is. Next slide, please. Yeah, you know, energy politics. Everyone speaks from their own interest but we have to think about what is the best interest that you know you know there's those uh, school of thoughts are different you know 
job skills and so on. You see, I'll, I'll just give you high level some of the weaknesses of renewables around job creation on the next slide. There's different technologies. Uh, you know, they come from different countries. Uh, they can offer certain things. They, they have all their, you know, weaknesses. Uh, this is variable. It's not, the wind is not always blowing and so on. So everyone is speaking from their vested, vested interest and in what is in for me, you know. So we have a different lobby groups. Uh, 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 trade unions are speaking for their own workers that might be compromised, you know, uh, as we transition to other technologies. So we have to think thoroughly and find the best solution for, for South Africa, for the continent, in relation to all these drivers that we have and find a position that we think would be suitable for South Africa and we advance from there. Next slide, please. So yeah, here I'm concluding. For example, 90% uh, of renewable energy dumps are temporary in nature. That's problem one. Uh, in relation, so in comparison to the coal value chain, where we have, low skilled people that can go underground and mine the coal, et cetera, what is going to happen? So you must think about the inclusivity. Of, and they don't have to be, you know, working in the electricity sector or the energy sector, Viluchi. but you ought to think to say, what you, how are you going to manage that? Using policy instruments to manage those possible impacts, if you're saying, or we understand maybe the other column there where uh, you say, okay, this, I'm see this is what I'm seeing from the climate science models. I have to do something, you know, localization. What do you do? How do you localize? Because if you localize, you must be honest. It also means that this electricity cost is going to increase a little bit. So are you comfortable? What do you want as a country, as a continent? Do you want cheap electricity? Or do you want, you know, to create industries? And I have my own views because you must think about this in a long term. If these are the new technologies of the future, if in the next 20 years, 30, 30, 30 years, we are going to be seeing more and more of these technologies, of course, balancing with other technologies from your base load arguments, et cetera. So the question I ask, bid window one, we imported components, we didn't have capacity. What is policy doing to ensure that there's skill transfer, if you can call it that, to ensure that when the 20 years of the project that commissioned in 2013 in bid window one, comes in the next 10 years, because the decade is already almost gone now. When that comes, are we still going to import those technologies or are we going to gradually build our own industries? So those are the type of things that, you know, uh, we, we have to think about. So yeah, I think uh, just last bullet there, I'm saying limited policy and funding to support. Where is the money going to come from? Because one of the reasons we have a RIP program, for example, is through these public-private partnerships. Because our country, even the continent, we don't have the balance sheet. So some of the reasons, for example, lack of infrastructure maintenance, building infrastructure, even beyond the energy business, is because we don't have the capital, the capex that is required. How are we going to deal with all these things? Thank you, Betha. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Smelan. I, I was quite um, generous with time, um, seeing that your insights were so um, um, helpful and also revealed um, the reality that we face as much as we believe that there are opportunities that are brought about by the emergence of these policies. Thank you so much for your contribution. Seeing that we've eaten up a bit of a couple of minutes into the next session, which is the first panel uh, discussion, I'm going to hand over to Mr. Brian Day, who's going to moderate 
a discussion around the mysteries behind the proposed local content exemption for renewable energy projects in the country, which is part of the proposals that, are, um, that have been uh, put forth to resolve the energy crisis. On this panel, we've got Ms. Kiran Maharaj, who is the chairperson of the South African National Energy Association. We have Ms. Tiloshini Gavender coming from Vestas, uh, Southern Africa. Um, she is a triple BE economic development um, uh, professional. And we have Mr. Maloba Tehla, who is from the ED platform, head of strategy and growth. And I will hand over to Mr. Brian Day to moderate the discussion around the mysteries behind the proposed policies. Great, thank you, Bertha. Thank you to the prior speakers. What a privilege, Stanley, to, to be able to moderate this um, panel discussion following hot on the heels of a, a really insightful, both grappling with the realities, but also deeply scientifically based. So a huge privilege. And um, before I hand over to each of the panelists to um, give a five minute um, introduction uh, into the topic, uh, just a couple of um, thoughts from my side that we'll be going into in uh, a bit of detail in, in the panel discussion itself. Um, there's a saying that we can easily overestimate what can be achieved in a year, but easily underestimate what can be achieved in five years. This has been credited to Bill Gates and others before him. I don't think it's very clear who said it first. I think it's true. And I think the reality is that we need to start the five-year process. So what can that mean? in terms of the pragmatic approach in the short term, but the imperatives of the development that Stanley has eloquently spoken about. I think we also need to look at past opportunities that have been lost, but also what are the real opportunities going forward? Where are the existing manufacturing facilities? Which of the components, and Stanley again started to, to link that, and ask the deeper questions around the reality of the economics. Um, by doing a deeper analysis, um, focusing on economic advantage, because that's what trade fundamentally is about. You may care what we can do best and you buy from overseas, but then you also have to export what you make here. So just a couple of thoughts um, to get people going. I'd like to then give uh, Kiran Maharaj, who's representing the South African National Energy Association, uh, five minutes to start um, with the, the first foundation input into the panel discussion. Thank you, Kiran. Uh, thank you very much, Brian. Good afternoon, Brian and uh, colleagues that have joined us today. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, to, ref to reflect on, I think, a very, very important aspect uh, of moving forward with the energy transition. And, uh, you know, five minutes is never enough to talk about something that you're very passionate about, but uh, I'm going to try my best to, to rein it in. So firstly, I think, uh, you know, the, uh, we, we need to stop a debate around whether we're in an energy crisis or not, and whether it can be solved or not, and start to focus on what we can do to solve it rather than, you know, where it's coming from. There can be a lot of debate around how big it is and what, need, you know, what needs to be done. Is it real? What are the different options and that? But uh, at some point in time, you need to put a peg in the ground, decide what action you're going to take and then, you know, build forward from, from that. And I think the whole issue around localization, like many other issues in unfolding such a large energy program, is about making decisions that lead to consistency. Because when you have a consistent position, whether it's right or wrong, and that's another, you know, maybe a debate for another webinar, but once you have a position, you can actually start to mobilization and mobilize and build capacity around that specific position. And if you, you know, I want to venture to say that the context of today's discussion was really set around the recent announcement from the president that in, in addressing the energy crisis that we have, you know, he put a challenge out to the various uh, departments to look at a pragmatic approach to localization. Now, pragmatic can mean many things. And 
we are all hoping that pragmatic does not mean take it off the table because that would mean a major dial back for the South African energy sector on some of the advantages that we've built since the start of the renewable IPP program, but perhaps even before that. So I think for me, you know, some of the key points that I just want to make is that when, when we look at a broader system perspective, this whole issue around localization and whether it is the problem around not deploying techni technology as uh, efficiently, uh, as quickly and as, as adequately as is required, uh, we have to take a step back and really wonder whether this is the lever, whether this is the pivot that if we address it, uh, we all of a sudden going to, or take it off the table, we all of a sudden going to uh, have a system or have an energy future that unfolds as quickly as anything else. So I think for me, that's a very important thing that we need to look at is what we wanting to address and the things that we believe to be the levers are these actually the levers? And you know, if we if we delve into the detail around why can our local manufacturer not be competitive in the overall picture, it might be a better place to start this conversation. And I think you know, Brian, you use the term about the economic advantage creation. If we manufacture things here, we don't have a big enough industry, not even on the continent potentially, uh, to sustain manufacturing capability beyond what we have to currently deploy. So we've got to think about the long term. And if you want to create economic advantage, it has to be a mix of both of local usage and what, what we can export to, to other countries. And for exports, you need to be competitive. So you've got to think about why can local manufacture not be competitive? In the last round of the uh, renewable IPP program, we saw significantly lower wind and solar PV prices than we've seen in the previous rounds. You know, somebody should take that price and say, if we manufactured this locally, can we meet these prices? Because if we did, and if we are able to, and understand some of the levers that we need to change to, to increase the capability to manufacture locally, then I think we're moving towards like really creating industrialization uh, in the sector beyond what we've currently, currently seen. So the two other comments that I'd like to add from my list, my very long list here is, you know, I think we start, there's been few speakers before that have kind of alluded to this thing around, do we have the skills to manufacture and develop the, the energy sector locally? You know, if I take uh, coming out of Eskom uh, a long time ago, uh, let me put that on the table also, uh, I, you know, we, we've been known for our engineering capability. There were, there were many phases during the last 100 years or so since electricity has been invented that ESCOM has been a leader in many things. So I don't think we should have this view that our skills and our capability is lacking, whether we've got the right mechanisms in place at the moment, not just at a company level, but starting from grassroots education level to bring these skills to the value chain. That's a, a different question. And perhaps those are the things that would like really contribute to, to, to reskilling and creating capability for, for local uh, participants in the, in the sector. But I just want to use a quick example you know, many years ago, 12, 13 years ago, nobody in this country had installed a solar PV panel. And when we rolled out the REAP program, it's characterized by foreign entities, both on the development side as well as the EPC side. But if you look at the people who installed rooftop solar PV, they're local people. They're electrical guys who went and learned a couple of things, got themselves accredited and created huge businesses out of it. And there's quite a few local IPP, uh, PV installers that have now become big players and huge contenders in the CNI space. And it grew from nothing. Not all of them are foreign companies. They may have learned from outside, but not all of them are. And those are the kind of things for me that we need to address from a localization perspective. Can you take these small businesses? Can you take these small SMME, single person owned businesses and capacitate them so that they can play a much broader role in localization and make use of this opportunity that we currently have. I don't think we're going to be building capacity forever and ever, amen. So we need to be able to say, we've got this opportunity now, we've got three major things at play. We've got an energy crisis that is characterized by unavailability of electricity. We've got the, the deep uh, requirement to decarbonize and we've got the broader just energy transition issues to address. Bring all of that together probably represents one of the biggest opportunities the sector has ever seen in many years and to walk away from localizing it would be really sad thank you thank you very much kieran i can uh 
attest to your second last point about the local rooftop. Currently having rooftop installed on my house. And uh, I can attest that there's a bunch of good solid South Africans doing it. So we, that's, that's part of the solution is, is we, we, we need more of that. So thank you very much. I probably gave you six or seven minutes. So uh, Taloshni Governor, Ms. Taloshni Governor from Vesta, Southern Africa. So Coach Maloba, you come last, ladies first. Uh, Taloshni, if you can give your five minute intro. Thank you, Brian. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Bertha, for the opportunity and to the panelists. Um, Theologian from Vestas. Um, as Karen has alluded to, a lot of the points I actually wanted to raise. So you've actually touched on quite a lot of areas. So unfortunately, my five minutes would not really be five minutes. Um, I'm broadly just going to touch um, on a few of the areas that um, Karen has um, mentioned. Um, I think the impact of localization is something that we need to not uh, walk away from. I think, you know, the creation of our local jobs, the skills transfer, the industrialization, our socioeconomic uh, development, I think we are making strides. We are not making ginormous strides at the, the, the rate that we wanted to, but I think nonetheless, we are progressing and we are contributing to the greater um, need. Obviously the need has now grown, um, over the last 14 years with load shedding now becoming a regular occurrence, it's something that we, we seeing that, you know, government has put in place activities and frameworks in which to help us. It's just that we need to also look at what the policy states and what the reality is on the ground. And I think there is that difference. Um, it's a double edged sword where we also need to understand like what we have locally, how are we actually managing those expectations and managing those resources? And what are the frameworks um, in place that needs to provide for that clarity. So, you know, we have our BE legislation, it has good intentions, but the cost of um, BE and the implementation is not felt um, locally, even by our global partners as well. So we need to obviously overcome all this uncertainty, this unre uh, unreliability, because again, you know, as Kieran alluded to, it limits our capacity, our capability, and it also talks to our technical skills background. So again, you know, we need that consistency pipeline, those volumes that plan for skills transfer, job creation. Um, and I think that the localized market caters for it, but to a limited um, uh, to a limited extent, because again, the constraint in the industry can provide some allocation, but it can't provide all of the allocation. So it's definitely things that we would have to deep dive into. And I think as Kieran said, it's not something we need to look at in silos, but it rather is a holistic overview of how each of it works together to bring about the end result. And I think that's the problem is that everything is decentralized and it's being looked at from that point rather than how does each thing work in collaboration uh, with one another to have that overlapping effect. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Tarashni. No, that's excellent. And um, in terms of the lost opportunities, while uh, the next speaker speaks, I think um, Vestas were very involved and instrumental in the DCD tower factory. Uh, obviously, that's one of that's one of the tragedies of, of the hiatus in the REAP, but maybe you can give that some thought for some question time just now. And um, as well as the recent announcement by Eskom, SCATIC as part of CPUT and, and, and the, the, the initiative in Mpumalanga and um, what that can mean of, of, of upskilling and, and, and the just transition um, uh, there. But um, thank you very much for your input. The third speaker is Mr. Maloba Tsekla. Uh, Coach Maloba, as you like to be known, um, please share your foundational five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And good afternoon to my fellow panelists and uh, all the audience. Um, forgive my jacket, it's a beautiful day in Johannesburg, but the room I'm sitting in is uh, not, not agreeing with that. Uh, but anyhow, so I think, you know, it, it, it touches on the, the, there's two points I want to make, and they touch on very, uh, very well to what uh, uh, Tiloshni has, has, has shared in terms of how we think about uh, localization. Um, I'd even go so far as to say, how do we define localization? I think there's quite a a narrow focus on um, manufactured goods, and then we should, as far as we are competitive, I think as, as, as Dr. Semilani has said, uh, but there's more to localization, right? But the two points I want to make, the first is um, we're currently in the midst of three procurement rounds, 
concurrently, right? We're looking at uh, between risk mitigation program, bid window five and bid window six, uh, upwards of 8,600 megawatts. And, and the numbers include some reductions in the, uh, in the risk mitigation program, which I won't get into, right? Um, and I say upwards because, you know, when we procure a thousand megawatts of contracted capacity solar PV, there's probably a thousand one hundred or more sitting behind that. Um, and if we think of the industrialization or the localization opportunities, it means we've actually we're needing to deliver that much megawatts, right? Uh, and and then the question is, if we are now sitting in three concurrent procurement rounds, have we planned properly as a country to take full advantage of this? And the, that question speaks to what has been said earlier in terms of we need to take a decision, wrong or right, as Kieran has said, uh, but we need to take a decision, follow that path and see it to some end, right? And learn and adapt as we do, but there is a fundamental decision we have taken, which is either, you know, we, we are going to localize and we know what localization means for us. We know what our competitive advantage is, right? So that's the question if we plan properly. Um, and then to the entrepreneurs and the small businesses um, and, and in the audience, right? Have you as a business and generally have businesses taken a view of this and figured where they come into play? Uh, and my second point will speak more in, into this, but um, I think to, to speak very frankly, uh, I'm speaking in my, not in my Sapia hat, so I can speak a bit more liberally. Um, we have been very haphazard as a country in these three procurement rounds. Uh, and that doesn't bode well for the longevity required and the clarity and view required for investment decisions, and not just into manufacturing or assembly facilities, but into skills development. How is it that we're only having this announcement with ESCOM and CPUT? And it's a fantastic announcement, right? But this is something that should have been done three years ago um, because we could see that we are going to procure almost 10 gigawatts of renewables. You know, and it's now happening now, right? So speaking to the planning, the second point that, that I'd like to make um, and, and linking on from the holistic point that Taloshni made is we need to take a system dynamics view. And one of our panelists spoke about this earlier on um, and in our preparations, right? A system dynamics perspective and a value chain perspective, right? And if I make, make a, an example, right? So a preferred bidder is going to be announced for round six in December, 2022. That's probably not the point at which an entrepreneur wants to say, okay, I, I'm going to make my move, right? So when, when did that preferred bidder happen, so to speak, right? We fast forward a few months before bid. Submission is supposed to be end of September. Is that the right point to intervene? But that project will probably have been selected into a portfolio for bidding in March 2022 by the sponsor or the bidder or the consortium. Right, But that project in March 2022 will have had its EIAs and other permits and authorizations started the process of getting them in place two years before that, right, 2020, right? But before that, there's probably been two years or so of resource scanning and land negotiations and modeling uh, and everything else. So there's about a four-year development process that takes that project to December, 2022. And the question is, when do we make interventions in terms of one, where do, when do we make the intervention on the skills development that we need? When do we make interventions and in businesses to partake across that value chain? If I'm a manufacturer or an assembler, four years ago, I'm looking at what is IRP saying? Of course, there's lots of problems around the implementation of it, but it's a four year process and not preferred bidder and now we're coming in to try and find our space in it right and this is talking about that 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 value chain perspective right and then also from a system perspective what is the system of support in place to realize uh, our local supply potential right so financing is is just the elephant in every room right you want to develop a project do you have 20 million or 10 million at risk to develop a project and bid it you want to supply goods into it? Do you have capital to set up a plant, certify it, get all the accreditations, and then negotiate with IPPs and other OEMs to fit into the value chain? 
And we need that kind of support if we're actually going to realize the potential for localization. So from my perspective, localization isn't an if. That conversation is, is, not, is not part of my vocabulary. It's a how do we do it? We just simply have to do it. So how do we do it? Uh, and that's my, my, my point of departure. So let me stop there, Brian. Thank you very much. Um, really great inputs. And I've crafted a question for, for each, each panelist already. And I'd like to start with, with you, Taloshni, around the lost opportunities and the dynamic of market pull versus policy push. And, and the extent to which one, the other, or both are required. And obviously, I think most of us on the on, on this webinar will understand that there was this hiatus in the REAP between 2014 and 2018, and, and, and what the devastating impacts of that were in terms of opportunities that actually started, but also in a confidence from people actually doing more of it. So, Taloshni, if you can come back in and, and talk about lost opportunities and market pull versus policy push. So, I think... Again, you know, it's a balancing act. Um, we have our policymakers who create legislation rather than looking at a holistic view. And that's, I, I speak because I'm an attorney as well. So coming from the legal background, policy um, is something that is great and it helps with, you know, our historic past. It tries to, you know, bridge the gap. And I think that it's a great initiative because it then puts us on an equal playing field with the rest of the world. And, and you know, we are able to then um, close the gap Gaps. So yes, from a policy point of view, it's great. However, the view when it comes to policy is that it needs to also encompass what is actually locally on the ground. I know you want to reach a particular level and you want to obviously um, reach a particular point of excellence. That is great. However, we need to put policies in place that show the development, the steps. Uh, what is the short term? What is the medium term? What is the long term? And I think it also comes back to one of my panelists saying consistency. I think that's where we have the gap. And so the opportunities present itself. We don't have the necessary skill set. We don't have the necessary ability to maintain and to, um, you know, uh, to maximize on those opportunities. So we are then driven by other factors that then, you know, um, stand in the way of the progression of those opportunities. So I think the localization um, regulatory space, as much as it's based on a compliance and it's very strict, I think at this level has no flexibility. And then it also deters a lot of our uh, OEMs. I will speak from the OEM side, where we would rather then look at trying to meet our deadlines and trying to meet expectations by falling on importing because we are able to then quickly get various, um, you know, fully built up assets uh, from various manufacturing plants all around the world um, in order for us to meet our deadlines, um, meet the capacity, because we obviously trying to prevent penalties um, and all of the regulatory um, and compliance contracts that, you know, are put in place for this. So as much as we sit here and we have this regulation, but everything is based on um, money at the end of the day. And so we need to ensure that those deadlines are met. And if not, then we have to look at the quick wins to try and prevent any more loss of uh, money. And we make a profit from this. So there's also the economic element to it. So it's a nice to have, but we also need to um, transition ourselves into the benefits of what we are trying to do here instead of losing focus and um, again, losing the opportunity. So, yeah. Great, thank you. One of the, the, the key things you touched on was, was onto skills, and I'd like to ask Kieran to come back in because I know that Sania has done significant work on, on, on your, your, your skills roadmaps, et, et cetera, and linking it into the, to, to the work that uh, was, uh, was announced recently and having been personally involved in some of the co-benefits work into, into Mpumalanga, obviously that was one of the things that we were talking about even, even last year, and I I agree as well with, with Coach Maloba that some of the things that we're planning, we really could have done it a while ago. But, but within all of that context, talk about Sunia's uh, uh, work that they're doing, but, and, and importantly, how it links with, with other work that's being done, NBI, PCC, TIPS, et cetera. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that, Brian. So, um, you know, as Sanya, we recognize that uh, having an energy skills roadmap for 
the just energy transition was a very significant uh, lever, a very significant contribution to understanding, uh, you know, what is happening in the sector with regard to skills. But more than anything else, uh, you know, not just looking at the existing skills bases that we have and what the status of these skills bases are, but uh, looking at what is required to unfold a growing, changing, uh, cutting edge innovation in an energy sector. And we've really expanded these conversations to include all the organizations that you've, you've mentioned, try to work with them uh, together to come up with what the baseline is, but then uh, look at what uh, the different, uh, through this foresighting exercise that we're undertaking with one of the uh, universities to look at what is actually going to be required for, for the future. And I think that uh, it's, it's literally the tip of the iceberg, if I must be honest, because once you've got a document or a plan or a report which tells you what you need, there's then the significant next steps that have to, to come in, which is, you know, so if this is what you need, how do you start putting things in place? The how, you know, how, how do you do what you need to do? And then, you know, getting down to, 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 to do it. Um, we've also started working with the EWCTA uh, in many ways uh, as, as Sanya so that we can start already bringing you know, the two entities together and moving the thinking from the energy skills roadmap into the, 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 the sector development thinking without even uh, having everything finalized at this point in time. But I think uh, you know, one of the critical issues for me on skills is uh, being in the power sector for such a long time. You know, I remember conversations maybe 20 years ago where we started talking about how we don't have artisans anymore and nobody's interested in becoming an artisan. And, uh, you know, uh, we're not taking up enough artisans every year. And we just watched the problem. We just looked and looked and looked and we brought welders from and, and you know, other types of artisanal resources from all over the world to come and work in South Africa. Uh, we've lost the opportunity, for example, like Madupi and Kusile, where we used large amount of artisans. I mean, thousands and thousands of artisans to build the skills base. And I think that's the thing that we need to focus on. And, you know, Malova touched on you in the sector, you as an SMME, you as, a, as an entrepreneur in the sector. I think uh, in as much as the energy skills roadmap and that that we're doing at the industry at the industry level will be very informative content for these decisions. But you need to start looking at it within your own environment. You know, what it is you need, how do you invest in it? How do you link up with various organizations to build this, this, this capacity? Not, you know, watch something erode, watch something not happening, uh, and then wait for this thing to be addressed at the national level. I, I really venture to say that there's so many issues in South Africa, I'm not sure which ones you pick, but these are the critical ones that need attention uh, for, for me, you know, as a matter of great urgency. Thank you very much, Kieran. You know, um, <clears throat> my grandfather, in fact, was an educator at the Germison Technical College. Of course, that was quite a while ago. In fact, he, he retired in 1962. But um, he, 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 my grandfather actually taught um, artisans. And uh, I went to a technical high school, was an absolutely brilliant foundation, even going the degree route. And, but we don't, we're not doing that at, at the junior levels and, and the, the, the training colleges seem, seem to have got lost. So all the more reason why the, the, the initiative with SCATIC and ESKIM, et cetera, is so important in, in Umpumalanga. So thank you very much for that. And I would encourage people to get involved. That's an ongoing study. And, and crucially important because it's interlinking with all the other people who are doing um, work in that, in that area. Maloba, I'd like to come back to you and ask a little bit of a, maybe a kind of a philosophical question, but I would suggest that it's, this local content thing is a contested space and, and perhaps important for you to answer in your personal capacity here, because I think there are people who are, who are hell-bent on suggesting that cheapest electricity, that's all you need, and that in itself will build development, and that's the way that you need to go. I don't think, yes, you, again, you, you're shaking your head because I don't think you're on that side of the, the conversation. And in fact, if Stanley's still on, we should maybe even pull, it, pull him in here because this is perhaps one of the things where we need more discourse. We actually just need to talk it through. And, and, and perhaps in the context of being prepared to start small, and I say that with due um, uh, reservation because that sounds like an excuse not to do it, 
But at the same time, if we had started small a decade ago, where would we be today? And that's that's the context, because I think you know personally where I stand on, on, on issues of development. In terms of it being a contested space, um, where do we stand and how do we get sufficient discourse to actually get some sort of alignment um, right from the political policy makers into industry and everywhere else? Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, you, you've got me. Uh, yeah. um, it shouldn't be a contested space. Right? There's a South African market. Uh, if we're talking REAP specifically, it's a legislated market. Government has said this is what we want to do. Um, those are the rules of the game. It, it shouldn't be a matter of what do we like, what don't we like. The challenge if we think again in, in terms of Kieran's point on find a path, you know? I'm sorry if I'm attributing this to the wrong speaker, but I think you said it, Kieran, otherwise it was Stanley, but find a path, decide on a path, let's, let's go at it, right? So my, 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 the challenge that I have seen, this is not about me, <laughs> the challenge that I have seen is that we, we, we the country, the state, are not doing the work in, in, in preparing to implement great policies, right? So we've said we want to localize. Um, and we are going to do, uh, we're going to implement the IRP, which means we're going to roll out renewables. In that, it's, 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 for me, it's a very obvious thing. There are certain components that we are going to need um, some of them are going to come from abroad. Some we think we can do. Let's do the work to figure out what is our baseline in terms of existing industries that can feed into this new industry that we're building through government procurement. Let's make sure that those guys participate. If we have a steel industry, there's no reason why they are not naturally uh, uh, you know, diverting uh, or increase, expanding into that sector. Those industries that we could venture into that we maybe don't have a baseline for, that we could do it. We, it's, it's, it's advanced manufacturing of certain components. We could go into that space. 10 years ago, why are we not doing the work with sector desks at various institutions um, to find out and keep tabs on what's available? What's the support that's required, right? If, if, if an IPP is going to say, no, I need a certain kind of component, a tier one this or an ISO that, right? Because the banker has said, that's what I need. Go to the banker and say, right, what do we need in order for you to be comfortable? How do we get this tier one or this ISO one entity here in South Africa? Maybe not for round one, maybe not for round two, but so that when we do round three, because we're going to do it, that is in place and you've been part of that so that when you uh, sign on that financing for that offtake, you're comfortable that that facility can provide what you're needing, right? And, 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 and I'm, I'm not even going into, to go into the consistency of rolling out, you know, I think everybody on this panel and in the sector knows what happens when you don't do that. So let's assume that's a given, but when we restart, do the, we just have to do the basics again. What's available? What do we want to do still, right? And then let's prop up those players that are available um, to supply. And, and, and the flexibility that uh, Tiloshni talked about, if we can't supply all of it, put a place, a mechanism in place to ensure that what we can supply, we do supply it. For me, honestly, and I've been called naive so many times, I, I take it with pride. It's not that hard. If you can provide five of them, cater for those five. And if you need an additional 10, let those 10 be imported and create a mechanism so that those two or those sets of players are playing in the same level. It's not that difficult. If it's a financial uh, rationing calculation, I'm sure between you and me, Brian, we could do it, you know, at, at the risk of being shot. Uh, <laughs> right. But create those mechanisms because you can preempt them and then say, we're going to provide, for me, the fact that we're procuring 8.6 gigawatts without a clear localization strategy is terrifying. There are calls for 10 gigawatts, you know, in the next X number of years. 
what are the systematic plans to get the IDC, the DBSA, the banks that have so much capital that they need to deploy, the PIC, various, uh, I mean, I know of institutions like the Mining Investment, uh, what is it called, the MIC, I forget what the C stands for, to deploy capital into those, to, to own sharehold, shareholding in that localization, deploy all of that capital along this plan and then drive it. I, then there's no ambiguity, which is where a lot of the problems from the round five and risk mitigation in terms of local content specifically, there are other issues of course, come from this ambiguity of what's available, what's not, is it good enough? That shouldn't be the case. And that's almost completely within government's pro, uh, 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 abilities to have planned for that and driven that very intentionally. So I'm hearing primarily do the work. And, and what it signifies is while we have to be pragmatic or whatever we have to do to get uh, electrons on the grid in Bidwindow 5, whatever pragmatic means from the president and the, and, and the minister, we should now be working so that we don't have to be pragmatic next time. Um, a quick follow-on question, then I want to come to Kieran on, 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 on the, 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 the contestation between cheapest electricity versus um, uh, maximum secondary economic benefits. You spoke about REAP being a, being a, a legislated space. Um, this week, we had a further 35 projects registered at NURSA. It's ramped up significantly. A, a lot of those are quite small, but you're seeing more and more in the 50 to 100 megawatt range. And, and I believe that we might even have a, a, a schedule two next week um, if in, in for public comments. And, and then within a month or two, we'll have a new schedule two that removes that cap already. Then you can have 150 megawatt, 200 megawatt projects. What do we do though in localization and all of these uh, socioeconomic development imperatives in private PPAs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> Ooh, um, very, very, very key question. Uh, I, I, I contest that um, we have not seen, and I'm just going to say this, if I'm wrong, I'll, I'll be very happy to be wrong, but I, I, I don't think there's sufficient evidence that private sector is going to act in the interest uh, of those we anticipate are the beneficiaries of socioeconomic development in South Africa. That is just not something that I'm willing to say, yeah, let's, let's let private sector run um, its course, let business do, the, do its business, let the market forces you know, solve for problems. That, that, is, that is not inherent in traditional business, right? So in the private sector, you, you, one would almost hope that with the, the REAP as an anchor, and as a stimulus for localizing, we would be at a point now where the private PPA market booms and there is a capable uh, and competitive local market where if I want to develop a 10 megawatt, I'm looking at components locally and abroad and I'm saying, I'm thinking, well, you know, this local one is right about in the same price range and I can get better service locally and quicker. Let me go there. And it's not such a huge question of, geez, you know, this, this local premium, which I also don't think is necessarily very, very clear how big that premium is, right? So the REAP could have acted as that anchor, but we're here now. And I honestly think that we need to, and I, I don't want to say legislate it because then, you know, it's like all government interference. Um, but we do need to have a set of best practices, whether they're in the form of a sector charter, which is a work in progress for the renewable energy sector. Let me say it here. Um, that says... This is what we have learned in terms of what we can do from an economic development perspective with renewable energy infrastructure. This is the more that we can do because we have 10 years of learning, right? And these are the sector codes or sector charter that we undertake to provide as a renewable energy sector. I absolutely believe we need that. Otherwise, we're going to have fantastic prices um, on, on these private PPAs, which are going to benefit large companies. We're not going to see... The, the extra economic development that we can achieve um, from building out this infrastructure. And we're going to wake up 10 gigawatts later and we've missed yet another opportunity to truly localize it. Uh, and I'm sure Kieran will say it much better than me, um, but the, the idea that cheap electricity is going to drive uh, oof, economic growth and job creation is, is, is a fallacy. Uh, 
uh, it's the same economy that has created or is now in a state of massive unemployment. And we're saying that with just cheap electricity, that same economy is going to somehow miraculously solve its problems. That's not the case. We, we have an economic structure that is not working um, and, and, and that fundamentally needs to change. So just to say we have cheap tariffs and that's going to create economic stimulus is false. And I think is, is, is actually a bit misleading, um, but let, let, me, let me stop there. Absolutely great. So I'm going to go to, go to Kieran and, and, then, and then after that, but I want to go back to Tiloshni and that might be when we start to wrap up on and Tiloshni, just so that you can think about it a bit, is, is specifically from one of the largest OEMs in the country. Uh, what are the opportunities? Uh, you, there was obviously the, the tower factory. Um, could we do that again? Uh, or is that once bitten, twice shy? But specifically, what are the opportunities for women in the sector? Let's bring it back to Women's Month and um, uh, understand that we need, to, we need to open the eyes of the girl child to the opportunities. And, and I mentioned one of the key findings of the co-benefits work that we did, that the renewable space is not perceived as male-dominated anywhere nearly as much as the coal-fired power generation coal mining is. So we've got a window of opportunity. But how long is that window? What do we need to do to actually open that window? But so a little bit of time to, 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 to get your thoughts together on that. But Kieran, please do come in and, and, and uh, compliment what, what um, Maloba has been sharing. Yes, I think uh, I fully agree with him. And, I, you know, um, when I joined ESCOM many, many years ago, many, many years ago, the vision at ESCOM at the time was to be the lowest cost producer of electricity for growth and prosperity. And at the time, ESCOM was among the top five cheapest electricity producers in the world. And yet we still had an economy with such high unemployment, uh, unexploited and unbeneficiated resources, uh, you know, the growing sort of poverty gap and things like that. So that is a, a very brilliant example, a real life example that cheap electricity doesn't relate to, to economic development because the value of electricity is to beneficiate it in an economy, is to use it. Uh, as a, 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 a fairly optimized and effective, efficiently priced input cost into making other things. But then comes the problem because that's not where the secondary economy's value chain uh, uh, terminates. And, you know, in the 80s, there was a very large uh, uh, South African entity that had scaled down its operations significantly uh, due to too expensive electricity until the investigations were done. And it was discovered that the problem wasn't electricity, it was the cost of transporting the goods from the source of manufacture to being exported at the harbor. So you've got to interrogate the supply chain for economic development in detail to see where you add costs. And I venture to say that there are several aspects of infrastructure development in this country that seriously need addressing from an efficiency and effectiveness point of view to create competitive internationally, globally competitive supply chains. And the other important part of those supply chains is having a significant portion of local offtake that can support broader export and, and broader sort of global development. And I just want to mention that an opportunity that's coming up for South Africa is a conversion uh, in the uh, EV space, the electric vehicle space. And if we don't use that opportunity uh, it's going to be another big must one. So that's something to think about in the broader energy space. Wonderful. Taloshni, if I can hand, hand back to you, what are the opportunities and, and what can we do to expose the girl child to renewable energy opportunities? So I speak also uh, from a BE point of view. So I've actually integrated BE into um, the economic development, um, you know, uh, regulation. So I work with both side by side. And so the BE legislation governs a lot of the pillars that overlap into economic development. But I think from the skills point, that's where we need to push. And I think, you know, I've seen, I've been in the transformation space for several years now, and we are making progress progress. Opportunity is there. So the transformation narrative is being achieved, not at the rate as anticipated or expected, but it is making a dent. And as an advocate for women, it is something that I see that education and skill set is what I push quite highly. And so, you know, having um, recently um, 
you know, uh, West has just got their level one accreditation this year, shows that um, the skills narrative, not only in the business itself, um, but also in the industry, they are key stakeholders. We've got partnerships with a lot of the industry stakeholders to try and tap into the various institutions and see um, how we can look at professional Black women uh, joining the environment. Um, there are opportunities. It's just that you need to have a structured plan. You need to work alongside your seaters and try to see how you can tap into um, broadening that narrative. So the opportunities, yes, for the girl child, it starts again at the lower levels um, where you need to integrate and tap into your schools and you need to then make them aware of the opportunities and drive that interest. And then if you support them through your bursary programs and through learnerships and incent, um, incentivized, incentivized apprenticeships, you are able to also get that buy-in. So again, it starts at that level. It doesn't start at the university level, um, unless you're looking for particular skill sets, you know, but I think that's where it all arises. And there are so many programs and there are so many initiatives out there that drive that narrative. And then you also get where you um, bring them on, not only in terms of joining the workforce, but also in terms of joining your supply chain, as Kieran said. So you broaden the entrepreneurial side. And so the opportunities are there. It's just that you need to have that investment. You need to have that plan and you need to be focused on it so you can drive it from different um, areas. So, you know, there is women in the industry, not a large amount, but the opportunities are there. And as we grow in this industry and as we, you know, see ourselves um, dedicating to the holistic view and, and to the actual goal of what we want to achieve. Um, we can see ourselves, you know, improving over the next couple of years or in the next decade. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I think it's been great input from everybody on the panel. Let's have a 90-second wrap-up from everybody. Um, Coach Maloba, if you can go first. Um, uh, if there was one bit of advice, if our president or the CEO of BUSA or maybe the, the most important five people were in the room or in an elevator, what would your elevator pitch be in 90 seconds? Uh, I'd first tell them it's a highly risky thing for all of them to be in the same place at once. Um, but now that they're here, uh, the South African market is an incredibly attractive one. That is why we see massive multinationals being here. We see new players coming in now still 12 years plus on. So there's an opportunity to be had. And what we cannot do is to miss that in the name of cheap electricity or uh, you know, procurement legislation. There's a huge opportunity to systematically, consistently build the industry. Let us have the state departments do the work, the DTIC, the National Treasury, SOEs, development banks that are available, massive South African capacity on this panel in this virtual room available to actually develop and build these renewable energy capacity uh, in South Africa. Um, and the time for, you know, depending on others to do this and funding from elsewhere, it's, it's, it's over. We have sufficient capacity. We can localize this all the way. Um, and let's find a plan and stick to it. I love your contribution in the chat box, keeping open multiple career options that stem from mathematical literacy, a, a great play on words as it stems from mathematical literacy. I'm not sure if it was intended or not, but absolutely. And, and, and credit to the industry associations and, and the IPPs for the work that they're doing. Kieran, your, your 90 second wrap up elevator pitch. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Brian. I think, uh... My 90 second pitch is that uh, if Africa was a wasteland, the whole world wouldn't have been uh, interested in it. Everybody's interested in Africa, so there has to be massive amounts of greatness. What we, might, we always tend to forget as Africans is that the greatness is there for our taking, not everybody else's taking. We know what all the problems are. It's time to find the solutions. I think we have enough brain power, enough capacity, and enough passion and interest to make the energy sector work all over Africa to leverage relationships between African countries first and foremost, uh, but maybe also to look at deepening integration between different sectors in our own countries first. Thank you. Tuloshni, closing elevator pitch from you. 
my colleagues have said it all actually with the amount of passion and dedication that they have i think you know um they've really hit it on the head um we at a point where we have the offering we really can go and grab it and i don't know why we are not and we should not actually be slacking we should not actually be doubting ourselves we should just be putting our foot forward and we should just be going 28 years into democracy we've got everything to play for so i think we really need to um as my panelists have um alluded to we need to just get onto the path and we need to just um make our way forward so i think it's for the taking and if we can allow um you know the outside world outside of africa to see what we are all about and what we have to offer and we don't appreciate what we have it's sad because they obviously can see great potential and they can see great benefit so i think we need to really introspect and um get a move on on this thank you bertha back to you Thank you so much, Brian. I think you've done an excellent job and the speakers have been absolutely outstanding. Um, I think for any entrepreneur that's listening in, this, this has been one of the most phenomenal discussion and exchange of insights in terms of our industry and what we need to do, um, especially uh, fostering collaborative relationships within our domestic market and within the continent to ensure that we take advantage of the opportunities that are presented by the challenges that we face. So thank you very much for unraveling the various mysteries that converge into what we are experiencing in South Africa and the continent. Thank you so much for also uh, to the speakers for making time to invest in this discussion. I know you had pressure uh, with other commitments. We're gonna go swiftly to our next discussion. And I'm going to invite uh, Ms. Uh, Janine Espen, who is the Managing Director of Economic Development Solutions, and Ms. Kalnisha Singh, uh, who is a development economist. And we are going to truly speak about gender mainstreaming, seeing that this is Women's Month. We have had a, a, a half the day discussing the complexity of the energy sector, the the challenges that we face and the opportunities that these challenges present. We want to now focus the discussion uh, to uh, gender mainstreaming and what it really means. First, oftentimes when we talk about gen gender mainstreaming or mainstreaming gender or youth or persons with disabilities, I find that people think that this is a social responsibility activity, that not often do people see the business case behind mainstreaming all population groups into economic sectors. And with these emerging opportunities within the energy and power sector, it is necessary to create an inclusive ecosystem. And this is what we want to discuss today. I'm going to start with Ms. Janine and invite you to share your thoughts, your experiences, and what you think South Africa should be doing to accelerate the participation of women across the value chains of um, energy generation and transmission and distribution and the entirety of the ecosystem. Thank you very much, Bertha, and good afternoon to everybody. Um, I think first and foremost, within the renewable energy sector, the RAIPP sector specifically, um, the last few bidding rounds, we have seen changes in how the economic development um, components of the bids have been, um, you know, inclusive of gender, um, youth, and persons with disabilities. Um, so when we report on economic development, particularly job creation, we do have, um, you know, sub elements which focus on the inclusion of those marginalized groups. Um, but practicality, or, you know, in actually implementing those requirements, we do find some challenges. Um, uh, you know, firstly, most of the projects, all of the projects, the large scale renewable energy projects, are constructed in rural areas. Um, in some of those areas, we have 
a larger number of uh, female population, um, you know, more so than men, because men have migrated to the cities to look for work. Um, we have perceptions within the construction industry, um, you know, that women are not able to do certain jobs because it's physical labor. Um, you know, we also have other challenges where men are given the, the um, opportunity for the physical labor work opportunities, but um, women still have to manage the households. So you have to find the balance because, you know, men, and we've had it in some of the communities where we work, um, where women have come to the projects to say, please, can the salaries of their husbands or their partners be paid directly to them as the women because the, the money doesn't end up in the home, in the household. So there are a number of challenges. I think first and foremost, we need to address perceptions. Um, we need to sensitize our communities around the ability of women, um, you know, to be able to do different kinds of work and not only be the flag ladies on the road during construction sites um, or construction projects. They are able to do physical labor. Um, so we need to expand our paradigm as to what can what job opportunities can be afforded to women. Um, we also need to uh, look at, you know, um, I think South Africa as a whole, we need to be sensitized to persons with disabilities and the inclusion of persons with disabilities in the economy as a whole. So not only in the renewable energy sector, um, we don't have a focus on the inclusion of persons with disabilities. We don't have enough educational institutions that allow for people with physical um, disabilities to participate in, in, um, in education, uh, you know, uh, where we have specialized transport for them to get to institutions, learning institutions, abilities, you know, ramps at schools, et cetera, for people who are in wheelchairs, um, et cetera. So as, as a society as a whole, I think we do need to start thinking about how do we um, progressively include persons, not only gender, but mainly persons with disabilities, um, you know, and then again in the rural communities, how do we change perceptions, cultural perceptions around persons with disabilities um, and, and, and how they can add value to our society. Thank you so much. I, I think what we often uh, see is we use sweeping statements when we talk about mainstreaming persons with disabilities with absolutely no directed intervention that even assesses uh, at what point do we integrate them um, uh, within the uh, energy sector. And I think it is important for the sector itself to conduct a study that matches uh, persons with disability with different types of job opportunities or enterprising opportunities in the energy sector so that we can start talking about tangible opportunities that are tailored um, for the designated group. Um, Ms. Kalnisha, let's look at how the energy and power sector um, can work collaboratively to truly integrate women's participation. In earlier presentations, we looked at the different uh, hurdles that continue to prevent um, women's participation, access to finance, access to market, access to technology, access to networks, relevant networks, and access to credible market information, which is accurate information delivered on time to enable women to organize to win. What are your thoughts on what can be done, especially given these various challenges that the previous speakers have, um, have presented? I think, thanks Bertha. Um, I think it's very important when, when having the conversation around inclusivity to actually name um, the, ex the, the embedded exclusionary, exclusionary practices in economic systems, right? Because it's more than just the microeconomic factors. Access to capital is a ubiquitous challenge uh, for women across the world. We see that since the beginning of the year, 
um, only 7% of deployed capital for private equity has landed with female founders. It's an extreme challenge and that's the challenge of networking. Um, but also specifically on the African continent, we have these conversations about getting girls into STEM, but we're not having the conversations about addressing period poverty, which is disabling girls from finishing high school um, and those embedded issues. I mean, I also think that uh, Janine speaks to like sensitization in rural areas around the jobs that women can do. I think there's a large scale remembering that needs to happen. I mean, at the same time that we have the very revered Shaka and the kingdom of the Zulu developing in South Africa, we also had the very revered kingdom or queendom of Queen Mantadisi developing in South Africa. We have a long traditional history of very strong women leaders who managed to lead and save and secure the land for their people. And those histories are not being told. So embedded remembering, I think, and understanding our identity as women on the continent is the first step, I think, towards um, addressing embedded exclusion. Um, but in terms of value chain development, I also think that in the renewable sector specifically, for some reason, and I mean, I haven't done any kind of quantitative or even qualitative research on this, but it seems that even though uh, communities have recently become quite vocal about their role in the just energy and the just economic transition, people haven't really identified their key uh, or core competency. It still bewilders me as to why external parties have to come into rural communities in order to do environmental impact assessments. When that knowledge, indigenous knowledge is embedded in those communities, people understand the ways and the mechanisms of the land in those areas. And those are things that we just completely discount. That's knowledge and information that we discount and we do not value. Um, it's also, as much as we, we talk about gender mainstreaming. I think, especially in the energy conversation, we need to talk about like the majority of the African population that is excluded fundamentally from accessing energy in any way. I mean, the numbers are somewhere between 600 million and 792 million people on the continent don't have access to energy. The opportunities that the international global market are seeing on the continent is in innovative solutions to address this exclusion. But we are, again, not trying to solve these problems, our problems for ourselves. I'm you make a very, yes, you make a very interesting point around leveraging indigenous knowledge systems and how that has been excluded from, um, from the solution base, or at least the outlooks in terms of, or the mental models rather, in terms of where solutions for communities or solutions for projects um, lie. I want to bring this question to Janine. When we consider just energy transition, um, we often know that people know that, people know that they're going to lose their jobs, those that are already employed. But how then do we prepare? What do we need to do to prepare communities um, to be part of the transition in a productive manner from your experience with dealing with communities around projects? Thank you. I think um, we don't value entrepreneurs in, our, in, South, in South Africa. Um, you know, and the rest of the continent people hustle. Um, we have a lot of hustlers in Africa and they make it happen for themselves. Um, in South Africa, we don't value entrepreneurship. Um, it's not something that is, uh, you know, if you have a career day at school level, do you have a career day where you have, you know, all the lawyers and the doctors and everybody else that comes or the university institutions do you also, you know, do you encourage learners to also start thinking about um, starting their own businesses, you know, becoming entrepreneurs, et cetera? And again, not only looking at women who may go into tourism as, um, as you know, a, a business opportunity, but looking at other things. 
looking at engineering, looking at um, IT, you know, ICT sectors, etc. All of those things. There's so many opportunities um, within the 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 energy space. Um, you know, when we work within the renewable energy sector, we're very often told. Um, because we have commitments for persons with disabilities, as an example. Um, well, it's a construction site. We can't have persons with disabilities on the construction site. Um, but, you know, we there are opportunities defining what is a person with disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's somebody who has, for example, who has to take high blood pressure medication in that instance in, an, in a, a work environment. Um, you know, so many people um, actually have to take that level of medication. Um, are we opening ourselves to looking for those opportunities? You can look at gender in managing a renewable energy uh, plant in the O&M sector. If, if you run a PV solar plant, you can do a lot of the operational management from remotely using computer systems. You can run an, uh, a PV solar plant, you know, with less than 10 people. So developing gender um, and persons with disabilities in your ICT sector to be able to take on those opportunities um, and to work, in, um, you know, in uh, providing those services is, is, is some of the things that we can start looking at. Um, yeah, and I think... Also, just again, going back to our educational system, I think, that, you know, first and foremost, we, we need to start there. We need to start looking at, um, you know, is maths literacy, how, how is maths being taught? Um, are we opening ourselves to having a society that is ultimately um, almost, yeah, not literate enough to be able to be working in the sector? When we look at the closing down of um, mines, mines and power stations reaching the life, the end of life, and moving towards green energy, we have with the mines, they are, um, you know, there's trusts and budgets that have been set aside to upskill the employees for them to become employable. But what we end up doing is we train those people in skills, which you know, are those skills actually relative to what is going to be needed in the energy environment. Um, you know, so we need to look at what type of training happens in those communities, um, you know, and, and making sure that it is aligned within the renewable energy sector and the downstream um, supply chain of the renewable energy sector. Um, looking at logistics, you know, looking at things like landscaping, environmental, um, you know, uh, um, et cetera, all of those aspects can be value add services to the energy sector as a whole. Obviously, construction and, 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 and you know, manufacturing also becomes important in those sectors. Well, one of the speakers um, earlier said, you know, access to finance is always the elephant in the room. And access to finance is emphasized when we take a gender lens um, to it. Wanted to find out, uh, Kalishna, on, from your views, how can we resolve access to finance for women in particular to enable their participation in the energy se sector? So the interesting thing that I, ha I think happens, or I, I know happens, especially in the South African market, is that we tend to have the conversations with the, with the financiers too late in the development of a project, for one thing. Um, how financial markets work is that the products, pro products, the financial market products are designed in response to a need. If the need is brought to the attention of the financier too late, um, there's no time for product development. That's just a sort of blanket statement. I think the opportunity though in Africa as a continent mm -hmm. is that there are very, very innovative blended impact finance, financial models being developed and deployed. And it is our role as entrepreneurs in the environment to network and find ways to access those innovative models. We know that commercial financing is inaccessible 
and therefore we need to go around the traditional commercial marketplace in order to access finance. Um, there's a, an incredible group of investors, uh, women in African investments. Um, they have an open LinkedIn group, they have an open um, uh, website, and I would encourage anyone who is developing a project or developing a business to go and check them out. Women specifically, from across the world, specifically investing in women on the continent. Um, I think the other, the great opportunity in terms of finance is for those of us in the, in the economic development space to use the budgets that are offered by our clients or committed by our clients in economic development around their projects, whether they be in mining or infrastructure or renewable energy, to see those funds as catalytic capital, right? To use it to de-risk enterprises, uh, to de-risk uh, commercial terms, um, to attract further funding. And I think that's that's maybe what we've done wrong over the last 10 years in the is that we haven't used those investments, the committed investments as catalytic funding to, to raise further capital. Sure, sure. Yeah, access to finance goes hand in glove with access to technology to on trade. When we talk about integrating women or youth or persons with disabilities into supply chains, there has to be something of value that they are offering um, to an off taker, to an IPP, to a utility. Janine, from your experience in working with projects and integrating communities within projects, how do we tackle access to technology for women entrepreneurs that are interested to participate in um, local renewable energy projects? So, I think, you know, I, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but I'm, I'm going to have to say that it does go back to our educational system. Um, we need to be looking at, as part of the renewable energy projects, using the socioeconomic development budgets to encourage IT um, development at, at youth level. We don't, in many areas in our local or rural communities, we don't have access to IT. Um, in some of the rural areas, uh, communities don't even have access to Wi-Fi. The cost of data is expensive, et cetera. So using technological systems is not something which is common. Um, for us, it's, you know, we switch on a computer, it's part of life. Our children have tablets, you know, they're two years old, they're playing with cell phones, et cetera. That is not always the norm in the rural communities. So we, we do need to start using our budgets, um, the socioeconomic development budgets. Um, the ED scorecard has also now started to look at supplier development being a core focus area. So for businesses that, you know, uh, local businesses where we do have skills development budgets, there's supplier development budgets that have been set aside, set aside there's obviously also enterprise development budgets that have been set aside. Um, all of the renewable energy projects have to have to implement these programs. Um, I think what we do need to also do is um, opportunities for collaboration. Um, there's many instances where you have renewable energy projects, there's mines, there's other large scale industries that all operate in the same sector. Um, we do need to start pooling our resources to provide sustainable, proper programs in those rural communities. Um, and whether that is from starting from scratch to teach maths, to teach computer literacy, um, you know, numeracy, et cetera. And that needs to be our standard because we need to ultimately be able to leave behind legacy projects to say that whatever we've done in those communities are true developmental projects, not just projects that are just, you know, touch here, touch there, touch everywhere, but actually not leaving our proper development behind. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, you know, we need to encourage the, um, we do have a lot of, programs that are based on education etc but we need to encourage where we have focuses not only on the youth and children 
um, learning IT, but adults learning IT, ABIT, you know, looking at adult basic education, starting from there and having a focus on that, because I think that is crucial in our rural communities. You're on mute, Bertha. Thank you very much. Um, so pardon me for that. Now, thank you very much for that contribution, because often when we consider technical fields such as the energy sector, it's very easy to um, ignore the grassroots and, and interventions that are necessary to build a pool of competent um, uh, women, youth, and persons with disabilities that can later on be integrated into these supply chains. One area that, uh, Kalishni, you've highlighted in your earlier contribution, you are starting to touch on the intersectionality of, of barriers that prevent women's participation in the energy and power sector. And I suppose the intersectionality of those barriers don't only apply to the energy sector, but applies in economies, in various productive economies in general. Do you wanna share how in your experience you have dealt with the intersectionality of barriers and perhaps highlight some of those barriers that, co or that converge into a complex barrier for women's participation? That's such an interesting question. Um, and I'm gonna make a blanket statement that the modern world was not designed for women. Um, and for female participation, right? And, and we can all see this happening if you go to the movies and you need to go to the toilet during intermission and then you stand in line. It means that the demand for, you know, of the woman's toilet was not considered when that building was designed. Um, and that embedded sort of persistent belief that we must just wait our turn is kind of embedded in our psyche because the toilet um, narrative starts when you start school and when you're in, you know, three, four years old and going through the potty training regime and crash. Um, and then the teacher makes you stand in line as a girl to use the toilet while the boys was through and then they get to go play. So we embedded in our psyche that we just need to wait our turn. And I feel like as women who have essentially, all the women in this room have essentially made it, right? We need to be quite audacious about owning our spaces and um, highlighting these very, very obvious barriers that we have sort of just decided to live with and be okay with. Um, and I think that as women in leadership, especially like when we're designing our businesses, it's important to design around just like, I mean, Janine touched on creating inclusive spaces for people with disabilities. When, when you're trying to diversify a workforce now, you do these accommodation kind of audits, right? To see what kind of dis people with disabilities you can accommodate into your building. But I feel like we need to take a step backwards and look at inclusivity as a whole. You know, if there are two ur urinals and two sit down toilets in the men's toilet, maybe there needs to be eight toilets in the women's toilet if we want to create a truly equitable workforce. Um, as well as you know all the other access of you know requirements, um, any woman that's had to that's come back from maternity leave and had to pump her breasts in the toilet will say like maybe, you know, a nursing station would be great because I don't want my baby to potentially drink contaminated milk because I was surrounded by bacteria. Um, if we want to have the inclusion conversation, we must really just own our identities as women and then have the real conversation. Because as much, because the reality is, right, um, from an economic growth perspective, if we're talking GDP, GDP is measured by how much you produce. But if we're talking economic development, it's about the capability of the population to demand goods and services. Economies do not develop if you are constraining the demand, the ability to demand of 50% of the population. Right. As long as we're excluding women, we are limiting the ability of our, of our economies to grow and develop. And that's just the basic business case. You're making, you're now um, uh, addressing the topic itself that indeed uh, integrating women, youth and persons with disability is not a social investment activity. It is a 
an economic imperative and it enables economies to function optimally with maximum capacity. And as we look at the energy sector and its evolution and the need for us to find solutions, homegrown solutions, it emphasizes the business case uh, to include other designated groups to um, explore solutions that come from those designated groups. I suppose in as we wrap up the conversation around uh, gender mainstreaming as a business case, right now as we consider um, the projects that are localized in different areas, I want to take it back to, to Janine. Um, and I'm, I want to explore with you, Janine, if you have a business case and an example where communities or women around a project have been successfully integrated into the supply chain. I think we, we certainly have examples of that. Um, you know, we have an example of um, a project in the Northern Cape where um, we ran an enterprise development program. Um, and out of that, a women-owned business was identified. Um, the business owner then went through mentorship and training, coaching, um, entrepreneurship training, et cetera, established a business, employed people, um, and provided services, um, you know, and landscaping um, to the project. Um, so within the supply chain during the O&M phase, yes, she became a supplier um, or an active um, business in the supply chain. Um, during the construction of projects, you know, everything is so um, constrained by deadlines. Um, it becomes difficult. And I think that's one of the challenges that we do need to acknowledge within the um, establishment of renewable energy projects specifically, um, because you have such tight deadlines um, and you start engaging with communities, you do start engaging prior to construction. Um, we are finding always, whenever we go into a community today still, you either have the women-owned businesses being the accommodation businesses, so yes, we do need accommodation. So they are integrated into the supply chain, um, you know, but it is traditional uh, female owned business. It is not the business where it is a civil contractor, for example, you know, um, that is uh, that we find in the industry or in those communities. When you do find women-owned businesses that are into construction, civils, you know, et cetera, that one can integrate into the community. The challenge then is, is that very often they're not, and I speak generally, that we, we have challenges of compliance. Um, and compliance on a construction plant is obviously crucial. Health and safety, shake, et cetera, having all of your um, compliance requirements from the Department of Labor, et cetera, your CIDB ratings, all of that. And we don't always have sufficient time and the project owners don't have the budget up front to be able to support the development of that SMM and to de-risk, as, as, as my colleague mentioned, to de-risk that SMM. Um, and, and I think that is where some of the challenges lie specifically within the industry because we are doing the development post the construction, post the opportunity where a lot of the, the, the you know, job creation opportunities actually arise. The development is actually happening after, the, after that. Um, and so when you're looking at the development of SMMEs in that um, community, you're looking at other aspects of development, not necessarily development into the supply chain. Um, so I know that with the latest round of um, you know, bidding rounds within the REIPP space, they are looking at supply development and, and it has become an element or a sub-element, et cetera. It wasn't there in the earlier rounds. 
Um, but again, you know, the budgets allocated and the timing of that supplier development becomes really important for it to have impact in those rural communities. I see on the chat, uh, Kalishni, you have um, included perhaps a case study that you might like to highlight. So, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, I think there's lots of really innovative, uh, there's lots of innovative work being done in terms of creating um, alternatives to traditional infrastructure. So uh, we call them distributed uh, mesh networks for that enable uh, access to the internet. Um, there's also a model being tested right now on distributed uh, microgrid networks to create uh, to create ubiquitous access to electricity in certain aspects. And I think the opportunity, um, so the, the, the story that I shared is a mesh network essentially. And what a mesh, mesh network is, it's, a, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a spider web of routers created around or installed around a community that creates a web of connectivity. Um, the routers are controlled, just like any routers are controlled. And, and what it creates is it, it creates very low cost access to the internet for households. In, in the example that I shared, it's I think it's it's 20 rand a month for unlimited access uh, for a household. Um, and we know that in this in this narrative of development, um, access to energy and access to the internet is critical, uh, not just for us currently. Uh, but also for the generations to come, if we want to try to keep up. Um, when I speak about like access to capital, I think that um, as development practitioners, we must like, Janine, I think maybe the opportunity is for us to have a conversation, but for us to have a conversation like maybe collectively around how to leverage like international financing in these projects, because theoretically, um, if you have a project spending or committing 10 million rand a year for the next three years, you can leverage up to um, eight times that amount in international financing for specific projects. Um, and if the projects are aligned, so I'll give you another example. Um, we did a sanitation project in the Eastern Cape as well, um, where we installed very, very innovative sanitation solutions in a school. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has this drive towards sanitation solutions. So we presented a case study and then got funding from that foundation to then include that sanitation solution in all the other schools in the community. So it's about, I, I think really it is about creating these collaborative networks to speak specifically to the innovative solutions that leapfrog tradi traditional development pathways for our communities because we can't wait for like the grid to be expanded. We can't wait for new schools to be built. The crisis is kind of now mm -hmm. um, and we need to deal with them in a very, very innovative way. Fantastic. Thank you so much for your contributions. I think what you have mapped out is a very solid business case for gender mainstreaming or mainstreaming gender youth and persons with disabilities. You've gone even further to give examples of tactical interventions that can be employed around projects to ensure that we are inclusive or at least we're building an inclusive energy sector. And I believe that the entrepreneurs and other organizations that have listened to the conversations will truly um, examine and explore how within their projects and going forward, we can consider gender mainstreaming truly as a business imperative and not as a August month celebratory activity um, that we plan ahead of time to ensure that these emerging value chains, and if we look, listen to our speakers, uh, uh, our previous speakers, the emergence of the electric vehicle value chain that presents such ample opportunity for us to embed women, youth, and persons with disability right at the genesis of the value chain and not after um, other players have taken market. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been a delight to host um, this webinar. 
we have had insights from a policy perspective to a manufacturing capacity perspective for different um, value chains of renewable energy in South Africa and what is feasible to a very vibrant discussion around the emerging policies and what, what as South Africans we should be focusing on to take advantage of the market that we find ourselves to embracing the crisis that we have and seeing it as an opportunity um, to uh, innovate solutions and be part of delivering the solution. So to be creators of opportunities in, um, in a crisis. And this last conversation was really to take the point home that gender mainstreaming is truly a business case. We have come to the end of our discussion and I would like to take the special moment to thank all our speakers for investing time, first to curate, plan, and make time to participate in the webinar itself and to deliver sterling uh, content for the webinar. We have these webinars on a monthly basis. I invite you to visit our website, www.awip.africa. You will also receive a link immediately after this webinar that gives you an opportunity to rate our webinars in terms of the usefulness of the content that was shared today. From me and my team, I would like to bid you farewell and thank you for joining us this afternoon.